<laughs> Hello, it's Tuesday. What's going on? We're I back. Can only, I can only mean one thing. It's another wedding business growth show episode. Live? Show? Yes. Yeah. Sure. We're live. Yeah. yeah. This I, is I live. live. Frank, are we live? I mean, it said it on the screen. So Frank, are you alive? I mean, I, I'm debatable. <laughs> okay. 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 Frank always always showing up with the stellar hairstyles, man. man you, yeah, Thank every time, bro. You look, showing looking, us up, looking good. There we go. So Big Earn said we alive, so we must what's be what's alive. Up? What's up, Big Earn? Big up? Earn in the house. Oh, hey. my, my ninjas, I love it. All right. Well, we're gonna we're just gonna take a couple minutes to chat here. Let it, let it fill up. As always, do us a favor. Hey, DJ Chris Dis, thank you very much. As always, do us a favor. If you could share this out, if you're on Facebook, share it however you share it. If you're on YouTube, I don't know, YouTube it to somebody. Um, okay, well, we're all jealous of Big Earn wow. now because he booked his Hawaii trip wow. in April. Congrats, bro. Good for him. Um, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Good for you, oh, cool. Earn. I'm like, I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> Moving on now. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I can so fit big, in your suitcase, bro. Fit me in the suitcase. Not for nothing. Big, that's probably true. He could. <laughs> big Earn, actually, I think he, I'm going to tell him he needs to come to Virginia and hang out. He needs yeah. to take the road trip over here on the East Coast. Come yeah, and then chill. slide down to or, uh, oh. Florida, too. Hey, thank you. Thank you. I know exactly what this is about. Thank you so much. Thank you for letting me know that. I'll switch it on the calendar. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, uh, so, Frank, what have you been up to, man? Uh, work and getting ready to move. That's yeah. been it so far. Yeah. So a lot of work. You guys closed on the old, uh, the new house there, right? Yeah. So yeah, well we close on April 14th, which will be a day that I sell and purchase a house in the same day and have to move out and in, in the same day. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Goodness gracious. I'm sending all of my positive energy your way. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, if, you, bigger, if you actually just want to drive up here and help us move. Yeah. That, yeah, so yeah. Got my little belt on. I hope you guys move. Hi from Katie, Courtney, and Lauren. Well, hey, hello, hey. Katie, Courtney, and Lauren. What's Thank you. On? Thank hey, you. Hey. Thank you. Thanks for checking in. Chris says, come up to New York, Big Earn and Friends. Yes. See, look at this. Big, Big Earn, you could literally start with us in Florida and just navigate yep. straight up the east, eastern coast. And you'd be set. And you'd be all set. You'd be all if set. He, he can always leave his Asteras in uh, Virginia, too. I'll take care of them. That's a fair point. That's a fair point. I uh, just want to make a quick uh, comment here for our friends that are on Facebook. In case it is not showing your uh, your name and your photo on Facebook, if you go to StreamYard.com forward slash Facebook and just give it permission to show us your name and your uh, photo, assuming you want us to know who you are and don't, not call you a Facebook user, that is how you would... Uh, <laughs> That's how you would handle that. So we just don't want to call you a Facebook uh, user if we don't have to. And crossing my fingers for you, Frank. Very nice. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. All right. And uh, one more thing. I'm, I'm buying another set of Asteras. Yep. I would love to leave them there for when I do events there. Yeah. So welcome to leave them in Florida. Absolutely. We'll take great care of them for yeah. you. Promise you that, Big Earn. We'll take great care of them. <laughs> we'll make sure they work really, care really well. And if anything we'll goes wrong, sure we'll send them back to, we'll send yeah. them back to Washington. We'll make sure that nothing is wrong with them ever. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, man? What have you been up to? Oh, my gosh. Just work. I know. I feel like I haven't seen you hardly oh, at all man. this week, which I is know. so weird. I know. It, work has been a lot. <laughs> and Marketing photos. Absolutely. Yes. Oh, yeah. We would have a lot of fun. And like video. That. Yeah. And video. Um, yeah. Just working and booking events and stuff. It's it's cool. So That's blessed. a good thing. Yeah. How about that's, you, man? That's a What's good been thing. going on? Um, so, uh, as, as we all know, and, um, if you don't know now, you're about to know, um, yesterday was international women's day. It right? was. And so hey, hey. I was, what's that? I just said, Hey, Hey, Oh, cool. Yeah. So I was, uh, fortunate enough to be able to be a part of a conference that was yesterday and today for inspiring women leaders. And it was a lot of fun. So I was the MC of that, uh, the, awesome. D the DJ, the MC, the game show guy, the, the whole nine yards. And it was a lot of fun. It was it was interesting. Natural Aura, what's up, buddy? It was interesting because they were using multiple platforms, right? So, like right now, we're just using this one mm. StreamYard platform, but on the event, they were using multiple platforms, and it was like, go here, use Zoom for this, and then use this for that, and da, 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 da. and so this yeah. big command center that we have in front of us now, which <laughs> I wish there was a way we could show everybody like how crazy and out of control this has become over here. Maybe one day we can, yeah, the photo. but. Uh, <laughs> But it was. It, I was glad that I had all of this real estate of of screenage a to use because I needed it. I needed <laughs> a lot it. Of screen real estate. I needed it. Um, 
but no, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I think it's a cool event, uh, and it's well. We we've been sure. a part of it for the last couple of years. Yeah. It, it, of course, had to go to virtual this year. Yeah, Otherwise, of uh, you know, naturally, yeah. you'd, you'd be a part of it too. But Nick did edit, edit some videos for yeah. it, and we had a we had some fun, like um, the office style. You know, in the uh, in the style of the office yeah. videos that we did in blooper bloopers. videos. Yeah, yeah it, was it was a lot of fun. So fun. great people over there. Shout out to the UF uh university of florida conference department yes go gators yep go get them all right which by the way have the same colors as your beloved mets there uh frank how about that yeah hey i'll take it and the same colors as these lights tonight yeah oh. it's and we didn't do that on purpose either yeah, that's really the craziness yeah. that's the craziness all right so if you have them pop them open crank them up whatever you got to do cheers. cheers to you guys have a little treat. cheers oh. to you my friend frank <laughs> rocking the coke all right, that's fair. Cheers, bro. It's okay. I mean, it's what it is. Sorry. We're going to convert you sooner or later. One, one of these days. Sooner or later, we're going to convert you. All right. So Let's if dive you, in. Are we ready? Yeah. I mean, if you saw the topic of tonight's then uh, show, then you know that we are talking about event industry advocacy. And I got to say that slowly or I really screw that up. Um, so this is really a very important... Oh, my gosh. This guy. Uh, he's going to make it difficult on me tonight, I know. Big Arm, what kind of convertible you get? If it's like a, it's does it be, matter unless it's like a Bugatti? You know, convertible is a convertible, be, right? Uh, my, let's take guesses. All right, uh, he's probably got <laughs> Lambo. <laughs> um, all right, so we're talking about event industry advocacy tonight, which affects everybody in our industry all across the country. And by the way, it's not just a COVID thing; it's a beyond COVID thing because, uh, as you're going to hear from our guest tonight, which we have a super awesome lineup of guests tonight. Uh, from all across the country who are working really diligently in their communities to help make sure that our industry is represented properly, yeah. make sure that our industry is looked upon the way it should be. And they're probably going to say this a lot better than I can, but just basically we all know that we need to get this industry back to work. Okay. And so these folks are working really hard on doing that. So that's why I'm saying that to please, 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 please share this, share it on Facebook, share it on YouTube, share it on Instagram, share it on MySpace If you're still on that, like literally share it anywhere you are uh, and tell people that they don't want to miss the show that's happening right now, because there's going to be a lot of great information provided. And, um, and, and, these folks were kind enough to share their time with us tonight because they've been busy, busy, yeah. busy, busy. And so for them to take the time to be with us and be with you all watching tonight. It's um, appreciated. Yeah, we're thankful for that. Yes. So let me run down the bios of our three guests. Um, <laughs> the original only fans. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love Big Aaron so much. Let me run down the bios real quick for all three of them, and then we'll bring them on to this craziness. They probably didn't really realize what they signed up for, but we're going to have fun anyways. Yes. All right. So you guys are, and ladies, sorry, I'm reminding myself to not just say guys You're anymore. getting better. Yes. Everyone should be familiar with our first guest, Luke Wrenchin. Uh, Luke is the owner of Luke Wrench Entertainment in Rhode Island and leading in the effort to get the event industry professionals back to work in a safe, effective way. Uh, if you're struggling for business in your area or want to help those that are, um, you want to connect with Luke. He is also a part of the Rhode Island Coalition of Wedding and Event Professionals, and he and his committee have put together the blueprint for leading the charge in your local area to reach out to local officials about how to safely reopen the events and small business industry. Next up is Megan Estrada. Megan is the CEO and principal event consultant for NSWE Events, formerly known as North Shore Wedding and Events. NSWE Events is a national luxury wedding and event planning company providing full event planning services with individualized design and attention to detail. Services are salt, excuse me, services are solidly based in the event design and management with over 20 years experience in the special events and wedding industry. I love that. I love that. And then finally, Heidi. Uh, Heidi worked her first wedding as a server at a bed and breakfast at the age 16 in New Hampshire and fell in love with the industry. Now Heidi's resume encompasses over 25 years of hospitality experience, including, uh, including the food and beverage manager at uh, a resort in Santa Cruz, uh, as well as food and beverage director in a facility and conference center at U UCSC before starting her 12 years as a lead planner and designer for Coast Side Couture. Man, I love this. I love this. Heidi is also one of the co-founders of the California Events Coalition, which was started in the summer of 2020, and is the California chapter of the Live Events Coalition. 
When Heidi's not working on fabulous events, you can find her hanging out with her two children, Skylar and Sage, and her adorable, uh, what is that word? I'm sorry, I can't, my, I can't read this very well. Oh, I'm going to butcher that. Uh, yeah. Papillon? <laughs> We're terrible. Maybe. We're terrible at this. We should have read this. Uh, it's, but it's her rescue, Biscuit and her sweetheart, Brooke. We'll figure that out yeah, when she gets on yeah. here. <laughs> all right, without further ado, let's bring all of our guests on. Megan, Heidi, and Luke, welcome. What's How is everybody on, doing? Good. Hi. Heidi, we really, we really butchered up the uh, <laughs> the, last part, <laughs> the last part of that. So, so what did we mess up? Okay. Uh, my dog. All right. And what it. kind of dog is it? He's a Papillon. Papillon. See, I just should have read it the close. way it looked. Yeah. Yeah, you had it. I didn't want to butcher that up. <laughs> well, first off, and most importantly, we want to really, really thank all three of you for joining us. Uh, Luke, you, you've uh, graced us with your presence quite Several often, times. which we appreciate that because we have loved supporting and following all the efforts that uh, Rick Webb has been doing. And anytime we can help share that with the wedding and events community, we love doing that. And now knowing that there's other people uh, like Heidi and Megan across the country also doing this, it just helps us be able to spread that message even more. Yeah, for sure. You know what sure. I mean? So I think let's dive into it, bud. Yeah. So we got some questions here. Um, so everyone, I just did it again. Uh, so everyone <laughs> that's on this panel has had uh, some form of helping the events industry, the wedding industry get back to work safely, um, you know, amidst, you know, this pandemic. And hopefully we begin to see the end of that, right. you know, coming coming down the pipe here. Uh, but maybe we can get into a little bit of, of everyone's role that they've had in their respective uh, markets um, and how they've been helping uh, in their adv advocacy groups getting back to uh, getting back to work. Yeah, let's start with Megan. Hey, well, uh, my name is Megan Estrada, obviously, and that we said I'm the CEO of an event planning company based in Chicago, Illinois. Um, but you know, I'm, most of my, the reason why I'm here today is probably more so about my efforts regarding national advocacy. So recently I was uh, assigned a position as the National Association of Catering Events uh, advocacy team leader. So um, this is because I, my previous efforts over the last year have been regarding advocacy first in Chicago, Illinois, where I created the NACE COVID-19 task force, which is, uh, was a advocacy group um, addressing the, the the concerns we had regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. So we started off in April. I started gathering the group together and we started addressing government in May of 2020. And what followed with those letters and that, that group being put together was that we were involved in writing all the guidelines um, for the state of Illinois and the city of Chicago. And those guidelines um, were, were in a partnership with uh, a consultant group, consultants that were brought in by government for both the city and the state. And we were able to dictate and control a lot of how the events industry was going to be affected by, um, by government's restrictions um, due to the pandemic. And then also open up that relationship of having conversation with them so that we can regularly get updates. Um, we have a voice. We have links to reach out to them and discuss details with them. Um, so those were released in late June, early July of 2020. And we reopened um, at a smaller capacity, obviously, in the state of Illinois and Chicago. Um, but we had really strong guidelines that were followed up by government as well as um, by the industry, and there was a universal buy-in to them. So it was very effective. And then, um, then we continued with those efforts. Obviously, we had a, another shutdown, which a lot of states did from that time of November to recently, where we're now reopened again to 50 people. Um, but during that time period, we also, at the last six months, we also were in conversations with government and making sure that, that our, our events industry was represented for some small business um, grants that were going towards the most affected um, industries. And luckily because of our efforts in getting involved with government very early, w the events industry was included as some of one of the most heavily impacted industries and amounts from $5,000 to $150,000 was awarded to event venues, um, wow. photographers, uh, caterers, you know, uh, wedding planners, all sorts of people, you know, music companies, um, all sorts of different um, categories. So we were able to funnel some more um, money back into the industry because of those efforts. And so because of all those efforts um, in 
the fall, uh, some people down in Florida reached out to me and asked if I could help them with creating guidelines and getting them in place in the state of Florida. So um, we did do that. We've created guidelines for Florida. Florida is a very different state, though, than Illinois or New York or California or any of those places. <laughs> so it's been a different effort um, in Florida. But um, it still was important. And we released those guidelines and we've been talking to government about getting them placed locally in each one of those cities or uh, like county areas. Um, after that, um, NACE recognized that we needed to go and create a national advocacy effort. So they uh, then at that point asked me to speak at their national conference and then move to have a platform for the National Association for Catering Events to actually have a, a, a goal to be um, working on advocacy as a main goal for the organization rather than just focused on networking and education. So we're now going and working with additional states and part of my role, um, which is a completely voluntary role, but it's still a role, um, is to uh, support uh, all the different states and areas across the country by you know, sharing information about different things that we've done. And we've been working lately, um, I've been working with the state of New York. Um, Luke and I have conversations about Rhode Island, although he's got it, that definitely handled. Um, the state of Maine adopted the guidelines that we wrote um, and I released for, for, through NACE that represented the guidelines in Chicago, Illinois, and that actually has allowed them to reopen right now, as well as I'm working with the state of Virginia, and hopefully we'll get more chapters involved with, the, with NACE, and we'll get more advocacy efforts starting across the country um, that can be unified. Wow. Love that. Yeah. A lot of work. That's I was, I was going to ask if that was kind of like a, I was going to ask if that was kind of like a national thing, but you, you obviously answered yeah. it. It yeah. extends way beyond just locally in, in your market, which is amazing. Yeah. I love hearing that. That's really amazing for sure. Yeah. Uh, Heidi, we'll, we'll bring you up next. Um, pretty much the same question for you. I know you, uh, David mentioned in the bio, you're out in California, uh, maybe a little bit more about what's going on. Sure. So, um, yeah, we founded the California events coalition at the, towards the end of May, um, and at that time, actually, we were kind of introduced to Megan and kind of started looking at the guidelines they were working on. Um, so we've known Megan since the beginning of this, even though we've kind of gone separately and done a lot all over. But uh, the CEC has really um, come together to try to unite the whole state and the whole live events industry. So not just weddings, but um, festivals and larger productions. Um, here in California, our corporate market is really, really large, as well as our concert market. Um, so we aligned with the Live Events uh, Coalition out of DC pretty early on um, and got connected to some other states that were giving us a lot of advice. But we are in a challenging place because um, we are completely shut down um, and have been the whole time. So um, we are allowed to have ceremonies um, because of a lawsuit that happened uh, during the summer. And so you can have ceremonies outside and depending on what tier, um, you can have them inside at different percentages. But that's the other crazy issue with California is it's a bi-county situation. So um, mm -hmm. we have like 52 counties. Um, the information was all over the place. The state hasn't wanted to acknowledge the live events industry in any way whatsoever. Um, so our first real um, piece of work was to, to educate everyone and get them the information. So we created a website that has a by county page where everyone can go and actually see. Um, we have county monitors all over the state who update it um, on almost daily. Um, because it changes so often. And so really a lot of um, our efforts early on were education. And and, um, and then we really got aligned with the National Live Events Coalition on advocating for funding. If we weren't going to be able to um, to work, we needed to make sure that there was money coming in um, to keep everybody's doors open. So put a lot of effort into that. In the fall, we did um, a, a lot of um, efforts like the Red Alert and everything for different associations um, and now right we're really trying to just pull all of these different groups together um, and kind of have a united front we did submit guidelines back in um, September and we just submitted uh, updated guidelines in February um, so we've been really active with that with the um, state health department as well as the governor's office so there's a lot of things going on I'm one of three 
co-founders. So um, Alicia and Kate um, and I all have kind of different roles. My main role is um, kind of the social media marketing um, and all the information pushes. So that's kind of where my energy lies. And they had, they had a great, by the way, they had a great uh, clubhouse <laughs> meeting earlier today. That, oh. uh, I saw Megan was in there for a little while. Frank Frank yeah, and I, I kind of jumped in at the tail end of it and didn't weren't able to catch all of it, but just a lot of great information, awesome. you know, in that one. Yep. Yeah, no, that's fantastic to hear. Thanks. And then, of course, moving on to the man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> <laughs> you've been doing so much stuff, Luke. I mean, we've we've had so many shows together and you've been doing some incredible stuff in Rhode Island, of course. Uh, but maybe a little update, kind of what you've been doing, and then maybe just a little bit of update about what's been what's been happening with you. You're you're muted, Luke. Oh, Luke's muted. Sorry. There, there we go. go. <laughs> now we hear you. There I am. I was just playing a game with you guys. Um, <laughs> before I do that, I got I got to pay homage to uh, yes man. Today was Taco Tuesday for the kids, so uh, I. Um, I had to do that. So uh, yeah, Ray, Ray was. I had Megan and I had a conversation earlier. That's actually our DJ who passed away was a friend of ours. So yeah. Um, but you know, I I thought of him tonight and I said, let me like get bring a little piece of him to the show tonight. So thank you for doing um, that. So yes, um, things for us here in Rhode Island have been uh, crazy the last two weeks. We have a new governor uh, that has certainly made things completely different. And uh, for the last two months, we haven't had a governor. We had a governor that was leaving to become Secretary of Commerce for um, for uh, the president, but it took a while for her to get um, uh, confirmed. So she wasn't doing anything and she wasn't signing anything off. So we're stuck in this this realm. And the new governor has done a lot with, um, with our coalition and been at our rallies. And actually, I'm now on his transition team, which is great. So we kind of have a, a seat at the table to be able to kind of bring forth some of the things that we have. And in fact, actually, I collaborated earlier this this morning with Megan on on some of those things just to kind of get some insight. You know, it's always good to hear, you know, different perspectives as well. Um, they did mention they're going to bring in dancing. So that's a huge win for us. Um, April 10th is what they're tentatively shooting for. Um, they're also bringing up capacity to 100 indoors, 150 outdoors, and uh, that would be at 50% um, of the capacity of the venue. So unfortunately, that doesn't always work. In some cases, I have a venue that um, can only do 68 because of table spacing. And so that, you know, again, it creates a problem. Um, so, you know, we're obviously working on some of these issues. And um, beyond that, uh, you know, those those have been some of the, the biggest accomplishments that, you know, or, or updates that we've been working on now. And, um, you know, we're continuing to see the uh, the relationship now, again, with the new governor build. So uh, I, I feel like in, in the next couple of weeks, um, we should be in a really much better place now. And then our, our neighbors in Massachusetts and Connecticut have also um kind of up their game. Um, they're starting in March in the next few weeks. Um, again, higher capacities. The only thing that we're trying to see is we have we do testing for every event. Every event has to have testing. Right now, we haven't had confirmation of Connecticut or Massachusetts is going to require that. Um, it's kind of ironic. If they don't require it, then that puts our state at an issue because couples are already have enough restrictions on them. So we've already had people initially saying they were going to go to Massachusetts because they didn't have testing and they didn't have um, restrictions on dancing. Um, so those things all play a big role on what your neighboring states do. And it's also important why to reach out to all the different other states, uh, like with Megan and Heidi and finding out what they're doing and what's successful there and what's not, um, you know, and, and I think that's just all how we work together. But that's kind of an update there for uh, what's happening here in Rhode Island. Stuff. Great, great stuff as always, Luke, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So so let's let's talk a little bit more about like the actual work as an advocate of this industry. Right. And there's a lot of challenges, especially both locally through the state, through the federal or national um, advocacy programs that, that we've heard about so far. So outside of the government, because we're going to leave that conversation separate and next, because, of course, that has its own challenges. What what different challenges have you all encountered along the way of, of kind of spearheading the efforts to be an advocate for this industry during such a challenging time. And 
we can start. You want to just go in the same order, David? That's fine. Yeah, sure. So yeah. We'll, we'll have yeah. Megan come up first then. Sure. Yep. So if we're not talking about relationship with government, um, it gets difficult because government is what is causing the restrictions that we're experiencing. Um, I think that talking about generally what the issue is and what the concern is that, you know, um, we as an industry have never been regulated. Um, and because we've never been regulated, we, we never felt the need to be unified regarding lobbying or having um, associations that are strong to represent the industry. We've never spent a lot of time on collecting data on our industry. And we've never really um, had to deal with a PR campaign for a specific industry which all of those things by most accounts, most industries have had to have had essentially advocates working in the past to do those things. Usually they went through some kind of association or some kind of lobbying effort. So this was a, the, the biggest difficulty I think that we've had is getting everyone to understand that that has never been done. And so we had an additional hurdle and challenge just to go and start addressing government or addressing all the issues that were placed in front of us because we didn't have all the tools. Because those are the tools that you have towards advocating for your industry is that you have the data, you have the unification, you have the, the PR content prepared. And um, you know those are, the, those are probably the, the biggest issues that I came across. And I think we're gonna continue to have in the future. And that's why advocacy is so important for our events industry because Otherwise, when we get faced with another challenge in the future, if we don't learn from this mistake currently and bring the industry together and strengthen it um, and address all the issues that we've come, come across during this time period, we're going to go and find ourselves in the same place in, in, in the future. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're right. I mean, without having that structure in place and that unified approach, um, you know, when I when I've made calls to my state government, it was just, oh, you're just a DJ. Right. And they didn't they didn't connect everybody together in one big one big industry. So yeah. that's that's challenging right off the bat for sure. And and the, um, th what I found, too, is that when you are dealing with government, generally they don't want to deal with an individual or a group of uh, individual businesses. They want representation from a coalition or association. That was the first step that I went when I was talking with people about creating kind of an advocacy movement in, in the state of Illinois was I spoke with a labor attorney who was a client of mine. And uh, asked him, you know, what do you recommend for making efforts? And the first thing that he told me, he said, there's no point in making any efforts unless you have a strong association or coalition behind you. And um, we fortunately had so many great people like, you know, like Luke, like Heidi, so many different people in different states who did create uh, coalitions in their immediate areas. And they're the, you know, they are the success stories of being able to bring people together and bond them. But um, that's part of my efforts with NACE right now is to go, is that they finally realized that they were, they and these other larger associations that already had presence were kind of the missing link. And that they, they recognized that they were behind and they didn't have they weren't prepared and they want to make those efforts in the future. And we need to continue having these coalitions and groups. I think, I think that's a, such a great point too, to think about because um, for, I know I read the bios of a lot of, you know, at least a handful of us on the show have been around the in industry for a long time. And mm -hmm. um, when you think about these, that's, that's kind of one of the things I've always said about like the networking groups and the different, entities that represent the industry is that you don't really see you know have not really seen a lot of advocacy and i think to your point meg it might be just because maybe they just didn't know any better i was like we've just all been kind of coasting along life has been great who knew we were going to have something like this happen and i yeah. think if if nothing else it's great that this is an eye opener to let it, hopefully everybody in our industry know just how important advocacy is not only in times that we're in now but after this, when we get past this, so as you said, just to kind of echo what you said, Megan, to be prepared no matter what happens down the road. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, you make the point that we never, we never had to gather together. And also we were talking about this in the uh, California events coalitions uh, clubhouse earlier. I brought up the point that like, you know, they, they do need us. Government does need us. The rest of society needs us too. And I think one of the things that, you know, I'm talking about this PR content, we need to make sure that we recognize that we are essential and that we look at our industry as essential. Unfortunately, I feel like there were also a, as part of advocacy for the future. There were a lot of people who work in this industry who see it as a side gig or um, a ho- we call one of my friend Fausto calls it hobbyists. Um, and there's a lot of hobbyists that go into this industry because or their intent on why they get into this industry the why they do it is because it's nice extra cash and they enjoy it but their why isn't based on the actual product that they're providing and the why should be based off of the product they're providing and um and and not just because it's like entertaining it's it's a fun extra gig or something like that Uh, and so so we we've had when i spoke with government quite often it was really hard because i would say to them you know, I am like myself, I was I, I, I pulled the single mother card as much as I could when talking to the Department of Commerce. <laughs> I would say, you know, I'm a single mother of two kids. My livelihood, my mortgage is paid and my my children are fed because of events. I am not superfluous. I am not extra. I am not um I am necessary. I'm necessary to my own family. I'm Mm -hmm. necessary to my clients. And I think that we need to go and also change the, the, that conversation, that internal conversation about our industry and talk about how essential we are and how essential culture, uh, society needs events and why they are essential to our lives. Because um, we need to remind politicians that they need our political events. We were talking about earlier on CEC. They need our political events. I did fundraising for a, a presidential candidate, and I raised a hundred and sixty. What was a hundred and sixty thousand dollars twice for him on my free work and my connections to the events industry. And then when COVID nineteen nineteen hit, they turned their backs on us. And they have to remember that they need us. And when when they need a favor in the future, we're going to remember how they treated us. Such um, a great point. Yeah. So, so I think that, that that's part of this advocacy is also getting just really passionate about our industry and recognizing how necessary and important we are. And I think something you said about being a single parent and, and having to take care of family, that was like literally the minute you said that, it was like a light bulb to me. Like that makes so much damn sense. Like. Yeah. You know, just because somebody else doesn't think that we're essential because we're, you know, a, a, you know, take it if you can have it, but you don't really need it kind of item. But our people who depend on us, we're essential to them. And and we chose this as our career to take yeah. care of them. And man, that's so valuable what you just said. I love that so much. And event, events in general. I mean, it is it, people do look forward to their wedding. I mean, yep. that is that it's essential to them. You know what I mean? Right. When that's happening and, and, and it's ultimately their choice, you know, so mm-hmm. for sure. Well, weddings, you have to also remember that we've uh, weddings and uh, social events are not the only things that have been canceled too. We had yeah. funerals that were canceled. Mm-hmm. Yep. F- funerals, weddings, um, bar yep. and bat mitzvahs, um, mm-hmm. birthday parties, all these celebrations that we have in life are yes. important and critical to our culture they yes. we've had weddings and funerals for you know thousands and thousands since humanity yeah. began we've had yep. these types of, of events and for government to restrict them you know we need to be a little bit more upset about our our culture being affected and yeah. our our psyches being affected because we need them and it's very important so i think i would rather people get really riled up about how important we are and realize that that's a huge part of advocacy and supporting these efforts. 100%. I love that. That's fantastic. Heidi, do you want to add any maybe challenges in addition to that outside of government that maybe you all are facing in California? Yeah, I mean, Megan hit on a lot of the really good ones. I think I think the tools that she was discussing are something that maybe people don't understand, but the the matrix and the data on the numbers especially for a state like california have been a really challenging piece for us we have been working on our numbers since the beginning um we just finished our newest marketing deck um and you should see you know we have like 
we just added in pride um, events and we were adding in those numbers, but you know, anything from, you know, how much money does the corporate world that bring in the wedding numbers were actually the easiest for us to find. Um, but also because there's so many small businesses that make up this industry, it's a real challenge to bring us united. So the other big thing we've been working on is the NACE codes because everyone has kind of these were spread throughout these different codes. Um, and now coming with these state grants, we're, we're finding that that code kind of has something to do with who's getting what. And so we're hoping in the next two years to work on a united code where we're all under the same thing. So it's a little easier for us to track that those matrix um, if something else comes up in the future. So that's been huge for us. And then the other thing has just really been unification. Um, you know, when we first started, we reached out to some of the bigger wedding planners and bigger event uh, partners in in the state big caterers and such and nobody really wanted to join in with us it was kind of amazing to me that there were these you know small group i think there's about 12 of us right now who are really active and then there's all of our um, volunteers who work like on the county monitoring but it was amazing to me in such a large state that there weren't more people who were um, well known especially in the wedding planning industry who are willing to step up and then that the organizations also when we went to them asked if they wanted to be part of our boards we had some you know uh, we're not really ready to do that so that was kind of amazing to me it's all it's changing of course now that we're you know 10 months in and um we've gotten a lot accomplished finally um but i think a lot of that is just due to the fact that there was no you know representation before we we don't have something like the restaurant association for live events um in this state and so it's been creating something um, while people are also trying to find different jobs and maybe leaving the industry and side hustling and trying to keep their doors open. And, and then also being a parent, I'm also a single parent of two. And, you know, that just puts a whole nother layer into it. Yeah. Did you have something? No, I mean, yeah. it's to your point. I mean, it's, it's incredibly difficult. Like you said, I mean, just people trying to keep their do doors open right now. Um, yeah. You would, you would think that there's a little bit more like of a com communal yeah. aspect yeah, that yeah. comes together. I know that when we first started, um, you know, I was on every single call we had, uh, we're all, Dave and I are also a part of MPI, um, our local chapter there. And I was on every coffee talk in the morning. Mm -hmm. I was trying to stay connected as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think being together and having a sense of togetherness is so, so important. Well, and that, and that brings up a thought that, that I, I had when I was listening to you, Heidi, and, and this is kind of a question that any one of the three of you can answer if you have one is just uh, any thoughts on like either are, are people offering reasons why they don't want to kind of be a part of this unification or, or, I mean, I understand the things like I'm getting out of the industry and sure. things like that, but uh, ha have people offered any kind of, if they offer pushback, like are they offering reasons, reasons behind yeah. the pushback? You know, um, we've gotten a lot of different things and a lot of it in the beginning was just, they wanted to wait and see what was happening. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if a lot of people knew how much action was gonna have to happen and how long. I mean, I don't think a lot of us really thought that we would be where we are right now a yeah. year later. Yeah, especially in California where we can't do anything. So yeah. Um, yeah. now we're getting a lot of movement and we are um, now that we're, we're, we're in the middle of uh, becoming a nonprofit so that we can make ourselves the official chapter for California for LEC. Um, we're reworking our board right now and we're trying to bring on people from different organizations to kind of unite that whole effort here. So I'm, I'm hoping for a change in, but there's also, you know, there's also a little thing that maybe we don't always want to talk about, but maybe some of those people were actually working this whole time. So mm. that's a whole nother issue. Well, and I was actually, I was going to ask you a little bit about that because you're in a really unique state where you're basically in a state that's almost acting as our entire country, right? Where different different counties are yeah. doing different things. I mean, we have we have mutual industry friends that are in California, and some of them are not showing off any pictures of doing anything. And some of them are doing weddings every weekend, right? Yeah. Or events every weekend. So yeah. so for you specifically, how much of a challenge has it been navigating as, as a state representative like you are, how hard has it been navigating those areas that are abusing or not following the regulations right now? And then also you probably have a wide gamut of people who 
fall on the we shouldn't open it up at all yet because we're not where we need to be versus the people who are like, no, it's time to go. So how have you navigated that in your state? Yeah, it's been a real challenge. And I'll tell you, we'll, we'll take just a little example of Tahoe. The Tahoe area is on the state line of Nevada. So you can be in South Lake Tahoe and be on one side of the beach and be watching a wedding on the other side of the beach in Nevada. So, um, wow. so that's a really hard thing for then all those vendors in Tahoe or on the California side to behave and not do it. And also they've probably just lost a ton of clients because they just went over the border. Um, it's been really interesting. It's definitely regional on a lot of people's behavior. Um, Southern California definitely um, has a little bit of a different mindset and they, they've they definitely been doing a lot more events than Northern California. But I think a lot of it has to do with you know the whole climate of San Francisco and the Bay Area and how they closed down even before the country closed down. You know, San Francisco closed down, I think, two weeks before everyone else did. So San Francisco is incredibly conservative. And even my clients from San Francisco are still scared to even have their events when we open, I think, because it's been that kind of um, atmosphere. So um, as, the, as a group, the CEC made the decision that we were um, not going to promote or even in our own businesses do anything that was against state mandates. And it's we don't call it illegal, but it's unlawful. So um, that's really where our stance has been is that when we do open that it's a, in a safe manner and that, you know, these kind of unlawful events are actually making it harder for us in the long run. Um, and our governors participated in some of them. So it's not been easy there. Um, one of our uh, state representatives, his daughter just got married um, in December and the LA Times called them out. So there's been all this kind of crazy political piece in it as well that makes it difficult every time we feel like we're getting somewhere then one of the um <laughs> one of the politicians messes up and we have to start explaining for them but um yeah it's been really challenging the other thing that's really challenging about california that maybe other states don't know is that our openings are really kind of all over the place like the wineries are totally open i was just in napa this last weekend so i know um it's a different situation it's not completely totally open but you can't have a bar open, but you can have a winery open. Um, so there's a little bit of challenges. Now they're saying that, you know, Disneyland is going to be able to open next month as well as other amusement parks and then um, and then stadiums at a small percentage. And people in the wedding industry are quite upset because they're wondering what the difference between, you know, going to a ball game is and having a wedding. So um, all of those kind of make it really challenging for us, but we're just continuing to push for, um, you know, the guidelines that we've submitted and to at least have a seat at the table and try to discuss with them how they can reopen safely, um, but also give us a timeline. I think that that's the hardest thing in our state is that there's been zero communication about when events can happen again. I thought when they said Disneyland was gonna be able to reopen, that would be when we would hear. And when we didn't, it was, it was a little surprising. Hmm. Luke, do you have anything you want to add to uh, just maybe some outside of the government, just any challenges that you all might have faced along the way? I mean, I, I have to agree with <clears throat> Heidi. I mean, obviously getting support, um, that's always the the challenging, um, you know, getting people to participate. Um, <clears throat> the biggest part, too, that that gave us a little bit of challenge was is also the same time that funding was going out. So businesses didn't want to rally and, and make uh, any noise because they were afraid it would affect their um, their grants because they the, the grants that they offered here in the state in Rhode Island, um, they were specific grants. So there was an adaptation grant and there was a what they call the heart grant. And these are grants that went to businesses that you had to apply for. And, you know, you just had to be lucky enough to get accepted. So uh, a lot of a lot of businesses, a lot of venues, um, you know, were kind of cautious, I feel, um, which, you know, I mean, they're getting a substantial amount of money. They don't want to um, put themselves in jeopardy, especially because, uh, you know, again, it was a. Uh, it was back in December. So we, we found that to be potentially um, a challenge for us. Um, but again, I think beyond that, um, you know, we were able to, you know, come together. The more support, the more that we did, um, the more that you could start seeing getting media attention. And I think that was really big for us that when the media gets involved and they back you and they support you, um, that is 
where you can be heard. And um, I mean, we had uh, a lot of media behind us and uh, I think that was helpful. But, you know, going back to the challenges, I think, you know, beyond government, that was maybe, uh, you know, the biggest challenging and just trying to, you know, find the commitment of people, uh, you know, w with everyday things going on with life and, and just in general and, and trying to get them to be on board. I think that's, you know, those are the challenges I think we found. So I think kind of what, if I'm hearing everybody correctly, and again, this is to anybody who wants to kind of interject, um, sometimes maybe some of these challenges are the fact that you have folks that maybe are either like, like I think one of you mentioned out there working, but kind of working under the radar, or you maybe have people that have potentially received some level of grant, grant money or government funding or something like that, that are maybe now afraid to almost feel like they're flipping that on the government by joining something along these lines where, where it could, could cause an issue. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, I mean, I, that's that's what happened with us here. I, I don't know, um, Heidi and Megan, how, how those things interjected with them, but I, I certainly know for us here in Rhode Island, it did. I, I, I can speak to it also regarding um, early on, there was a lot of hesitancy to uh, reopen the industry. So um, I was really fortunate in, um, you know, we're, we're talking 10 months later now, almost a year later now. Mm -hmm. um, it, but when this first started happening, the, I, I, I was concerned that there were a lot of people who just didn't want to make trouble. And they just accepted the terms of, I called it the demonizing of the events industry because oh, yes. immediately the CDC released um, guidelines, as we all were aware of, re reducing the amount of counts on, on events from, to 50 and then even lower. And the CDC was making those recommendations. And um, I felt immediately that that was being made recklessly. I thought that that was going to go and have a negative impact on how pu the public saw our industry and how the pu even the industry saw themselves. You have to be careful about how you address an industry because it can make them look like they're at fault. And we know, I know, we can have safe events just as you can have a safe dining experience at a restaurant or you can have a safe amusement park experience. And so when they put that out there and it was such a featured element, yet there was no representation in that um, restriction by the industry, that was a really disappointing point. So there was a lot of people, though, that didn't want to um, upset public opinion. So when I started addressing the fact that I said, well, we have to make a plan to how we're going to get back to work, I felt very strongly that the only way the industry was going to recover was by getting back to work. Mm -hmm. And um, I was met with some opposition, even by coalition leaders. Um, you know, a lot of the coalition like was focused more so, the coalitions were focused more so on um, getting federal aid and getting PPP passed and all these different things regarding legislation. And they were writing senators and representatives and they were writing to national also government and trying to get that passed through. And we ignored the fact that we needed to self-regulate ourselves in localized states and build up relationships locally with government. And that's why we were so successful in Illinois. And that's why we're, we're I, I consider us ahead of the game as far as understanding how to apply guidelines, how to interpret them, how to do events safely until we get to a full reopening. And I, you know, I had a conversation with a coalition right away that we ended up bonding together later and coming back. And my conversation was, I want to get the us reopen. I want to be doing events as soon as possible. I want our industry to have the ability to do events as soon as possible. And their, their thought was, well, we don't think that we're going to open for a very long time. So we just would rather see focus on federal aid. And they came back later and they said that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. That was a huge mistake to be focused on the federal aid and being, because um, there's no amount of federal aid that can replace working. Yeah, that's, right. that's 100 percent. So I think that the, a, a lot of that was to like people were looking for those grant money, but they were short sighted. They yes. weren't thinking about um, how how long this could go on. I was really fortunate. My sister is the uh, the, the in charge of COVID-19. She's one of the top HR people for one of the largest liquor companies in the world. And she 
um, was on the phone with you starting in February. She was doing calls with Italy. She was doing calls with, uh, you know, with Napa. She was doing all those conversations for their wineries and the distilleries across the world. And she called me and told me, I remember on, it was on March 15th, she told, called me and said, this is the worst disaster that we're going to see in our entire lifetimes. And you need to be prepared. And that's, I, maybe I'm just lucky and fortunate that I had that call to be able to tell me what I needed to do and how we should expect this to play out. But um, I think that we, we needed to have more of a unified voice expressing that early so that people didn't cut, get caught up in the short-sightedness of, if I just stay cool and stay quiet, they're going to let me open and I'm going to, and I'll get some grant money, which we know is not true. Yeah. Well, I think it's yeah. great that you at least use that voice to, to kind of get going and not, you know, and, and what you've done so far is a, has really helped and affected so many, you know, so many people. So I definitely appreciate and commend you for all that effort, you know. And you mentioned Fausto earlier. One of the things that he said to me, uh, actually, it might it might have been in a clubhouse conversation, but I, I, I distinctly remember him saying that, you know, what's interesting is we work in an industry that probably does the best job at contact tracing before we even knew we were doing it, yeah. you know. Yep. And, and so if we're if, if we're able to convey that message and, and even just that small win to be able to have that message understood, it really propels the conversation a lot further. Oh, absolutely. We missed we missed uh, we missed the conversation when we should have had it. and we should have had the ability to have that conversation um, in April, we should have been having that conversation in March, you know? Yeah. So, um, now we're making up for it and everybody's, you know, there's amazing people out there who are advocating. It's just that we need to get more support. There needs to be more people who are connectors, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Agree with that. yeah. And just to kind of piggyback off of one thing you said, that'll kind of let us roll into the next, uh, the next point or the next question here is, um, no matter what, no matter what they put out there to assist people, the, the federal, the state governments through aid, I, that's what I do for a living on my day job side. I, I work for the State Department of Social Services in Virginia, and, and I and I am responsible for getting benefits, uh, food stamps, cash assistance, Medicaid assist, medical assistance out to millions of people across the state. And no matter how much you help, people still need additional assistance. That's not enough normally and so in this huge pandemic this huge this huge issue across the whole entire united states and the world for that matter there is no amount of money that's going to solve these problems you know so if, if we don't start coming together and and aligning visions you know and working towards it nothing's nothing's ever going to change in our industry and so i i just commend you all for for spearheading that um which leads us into the next question that we've got here so Government is a really challenging thing, right? You have to learn different terminology. You have to learn how to focus on the information in a different way than you normally would. Um, you know, when, you, when you're assessing your business, uh, whatever, that, whatever that field is, you know all the terms for your business. You know how to look at your own money, your own budgets. When you're, when you're having to convey that to a, to a local, state, federal government, it's a much different conversation. And there's a much different set of challenges at that point. So when, and we'll start with Megan, when you decided to kind of uh, spearhead the advocacy that you were in Chicago, how did you navigate or how did you educate yourself on how to deal with, with your local Chicago government and then also the state government of Illinois? Sure. Uh I didn't have a uh, cliff notes for this. Let's just say that I didn't have um, lobbying uh, for dummies. I probably, I should probably look up. Is there a lobbying for dummies book that we could have pulled <laughs> Let's up? Let's hope right? so. <laughs> well, so. If not, you can probably make it now. Maybe I can write it. Um, so <laughs> the, uh, the, I didn't have any understanding. So I reached out to as many uh people in the legal field that, and politics that I knew. And so that was, um, you know, I think that that goes so in hand also with our industry. I was, you know, on a, a clubhouse just listening in earlier and talking about, you know, your vendor partnerships. And maybe it's just innately because I'm in a, a, I'm a wedding and event planner and we rely so heavily on our partnerships of our vendors through the industry that we, you know, I'm very 
happy to go out and say, how do I get this done to people? Or ask a vendor, like, what do you think is the best solution to this? Because I've learned that that's how we get the best solutions for our events. So I think I, I approached it from that same perspective of how do we, how do I get this done? And I asked everyone who is politically connected that I know, um, as far as, you know, labor attorneys, I spoke with um, an entertainment lawyer friend of mine. Um, I additionally spoke with um, my friends who are politically connected from doing um, presidential fundraising and things like that. Um, and and just ask them. I, I was actually, it was. I had an aha moment where I got out of the shower one morning and I text my friend who uh, ran campaigns for many people in Chicago and Illinois and things like that. And I reached out to him and I said, I want to do this. How do I do it? And he said, you need to write a letter to the governor and the city of Ch and the mayor of Chicago and tell them about the crisis that's going on in the industry and um, and what that you guys that you what your objectives are. And so I did that. And then I also had to go online and read, um, read up on information that I never had any patience or interest in looking at previously, right? Uh, government documents, right? Or um, looking at how do you write a letter to the governor of your state? I mean, I had to go, I, I luckily had some help. I, and then I had, and then I was partnered with NACE who was able to go and double check my work. And my, my partner in crime and through a lot of this has been also Doug Quattrini, who was the previous uh, president of NACE nationally. And he was great at double checking things and, and we were, and us having good conversations. But I really think that that was, you know, it was a learn by under fire, which, um, and, you know, I think that some of the strongest people in industry also function that way where you, maybe you don't have all the answers, but you throw yourself into the fire or throw yourself into the water and see if you can swim and figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. And learning about, uh, how to communicate with the government <laughs> is, is That's crazy. Yeah. It's not, it's not fun. I mean, I, I spent years learning how to read our own policy with, with the state government and it's, it's a train wreck. So to figure it out without any help is just, I commit. Well, I was very fortunate and that's where I do say too that, and I appreciate so much like Heidi reached out that her group reached out to us um, early on about, uh, it, about what guidelines we had in, the, in in our state, because we were really fortunate in the state of Illinois and in Chicago that they hired consulting groups who knew how to write guidelines for every single industry that were written this way in a manner that governments would understand, and it was in their in kind of their structure. But then, additionally, within um, a, a structure that could be broad enough, but also detailed enough to not be overwhelming because I think that, you know, Heidi and I had a conversation about some guidelines that we've seen that are, they're, 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 they're too hard to read. They're too hard to understand. I felt that way about the New York state guidelines when they came out just a few weeks ago or two, it was a week, a week ago or, or so um, that, you know, I, I, that was my fear with working with the groups there was that the guidelines were going to come out and they were just going to be abominable. And I feel like they are abominable. They're, I think that they're written by people who don't understand the industry. So there was no partnership. And then additionally, um, were written to not be detailed enough regarding certain aspects, but also um, too detailed regarding other aspects. So it's it, it's it's a fine art, I feel like we've, we've mastered of getting these guidelines in order and understanding how they can be applied. And even Luke and I have conversations about like how to interpret, why do you write it one way versus the other and how, and, and sometimes you write guidelines to be broad enough so that they can be interpreted the way that we intend for them to be interpreted, but then government doesn't have to actually agree to it. So it's, it's an interesting process. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, it is definitely challenging. Heidi, how did you learn how to? How did you learn how to navigate through um, the the communication, the different terminology, and and how to start advocating uh, for your in, for the industry in California? Yeah, this was definitely not my cup of tea. I mean, as a wedding planner, um, I wear many hats, um, but this wasn't one I was expecting. It's actually really interesting about. Um, 
three years ago, um, Big Sur, which is just to the south of us, had the largest wildfire that it had ever happened in California. And, and we had it for three months and it was in the middle of our wedding season. Um, and it was affecting a lot of our events. And I started um, setting fire maps and learning how to listen to Cal Fire. And, um, and I had to do it because it was, you know, all my plan Bs and how was I gonna take care of these people that had ash raining on their weddings. Um, and so I took some of that in the very beginning of this and started to think a little outside of the event world box and how do I get information and how do we find things? You couldn't find anything on any website that had anything to do with live events. We weren't a drop down, we weren't nothing. So um, I was really fortunate that I reached out to Kate, um, who's one of our other co-founders, who is a good friend of mine, a great planner up in Sacramento. And we were having these conversations. Why isn't anybody saying anything or doing anything or standing up? And um, she actually said that she had just seen a letter that Alicia had just written, who's our other co-founder, um, to the governor. And it was pretty it was pretty intense and it was well done and she um she had a lot of experience running events for um for some government people and so she, she had a little bit more of the language knowledge that i didn't really have and so the three of us kind of came together and started putting that letter writing campaign um and using those kind of skills i think a lot of wedding planners have where you go source the information you don't have an answer you go figure it out you go find it um and I just saw in the chats about how to find the contact information for your representatives. When you have 52 counties, it's a little bit more challenging. And so um, putting together our network. Um, and then also we have just this amazing um, resource that the Live Events Coalition um, has um, a government affairs uh, position. His name is Dwayne and he is from Oregon. And early on, he was running the Oregon Coalition Early on, he was coaching us in a lot of what we were doing, how we were writing our letters, the right way to go about it, how to tag people. So it's been really networking and reaching out and thinking outside of the box. And um, it's gotten easier as we go. I will say that when we were working on the legislative pieces, that reading those bills was um, really making me know I never want to go into politics. And I'm really glad I didn't become a lawyer. Um, but because that stuff is just crazy to have to read, but it's, it's, I think it's a good thing too. I have to say outside of what I do for a living, it made me a lot more, um, aware of how my state runs. I, I think that might be really important for all small businesses to understand. And especially when you get into a situation like this, where you're trying to keep your doors open, you know, know who to go to. Oh. Luke. Yes. Ah, so I think the challenging is finding to cut through all the layers. Um, there's so many different layers and, you know, and it's funny cause you talk to, so for us, we have commerce, we have Rhode Island department of health, we have department of business regulations, you know? And so those are the people we typically are dealing with directly. So it's funny how, you know, they, give you one person and that person shares it to the other person. So by the time you get through, it's like, where did it go? It stopped. It, it was like, yeah, uh, I, I had, um, I had actually one of the calls with, um, uh, the doctor who literally runs every press conference and talks about all the health, um, initiatives and, and what's going on. And so literally she was on the call and we talked about, um, dancing and we, we were trying to bring in dancing and she's like, well, this was the first time really hearing it directly and getting a sense of how important it is to your industry. And it's different hearing it from commerce, but hearing it from you, um, it makes more sense and what you guys have done and what you guys have uh, put forward to make it safe for it to happen. So we will work on that. And then that's when uh, two weeks later, we actually did get the announcement. Um, so it was, uh, it's interesting. Again, it, it's the layers of getting through. I know media was very crucial in helping us when we did the rallies. It was funny when they were actually doing the press conference, they would actually interview them and say, oh, the uh, coalition is outside. Are you planning to speak with them? This was to our governor at the time. And she says, well, yeah, we'll sit down. We'll, we'll make an arrangement and we'll have a table discussion. She got asked that question three times in a matter of uh, I don't know, three, four months. 
never did that happen. Never did we have a one-on-one -on -one like she like she said. We always got kind of put into um, the uh, the other team. So I feel like that was the challenge a lot for us with government and um, just trying to get through the layers and trying to get to the right people, the decision makers. Uh, those that's really the biggest thing, and they always they give you uh, other people so you can kind of um, go through them and, and, and again, it doesn't end up getting through on the other line. So that's kind of where I found um, some of the biggest challenges that we had. Um, and, you know, eventually we were able again to push forward. And now we've got, like I said, a seat at the table with the governor. And that was just by chance because he happened to be the lieutenant governor and uh, the transition happened. So that worked out really well for us. But um, yeah, that's that's where we've been with government. No, I just gotta say that this is uh, this has been a, this has been a great show so far. Like, uh, it's high level conversation. You, you kind, well, you yeah. kind of think about like it being being again. I, I keep referencing being in Florida and and being as quote unquote open as we've been yeah. in some areas, like in corporate events and things like that, it's are still are still down. not happening. Yeah. But from from a social event standpoint and wedding standpoint, I mean, we are kind of you know back to working, but yeah just listening to all of you talk about this it, it it's one of those things where we knew that we wanted to kind of be behind this regardless even though like we're in the situation yeah. we are in florida but now even more so understanding the deeper passion and de deeper reason behind it that megan you yeah. you've talked about a lot and all, all of you have talked about a lot um it just just really makes me good that, that we're uh, we're able to continue to keep bringing this and we're going to do that. We're going to continue to keep doing whatever we can. Um, you, you know, the audience that we have, thank goodness, are, are pretty loyal and, and come see us every week. And yeah. we appreciate them for doing that. And so hopefully if we can continue to keep spreading the word that way and helping everybody understand why this, this is not an effort that can just be done by a small collective group of people. We really it's all a, have to get yeah. together and do this. It's definitely a national effort for sure it's pretty uh it's pretty impressive so yeah. um so we're gonna get we're getting a little bit closer to the end of the, the show here and i always like to let the audience watching know that if you have any questions or comments uh please start sending those in uh whatever platform you're on right now if you do have any comments for anybody on our panel tonight uh go ahead and drop those in and i know sometimes facebook is a little bit delayed so yeah. i like to ask that ahead of time and as we kind of start wrapping the show up and we'll see if any uh, questions do come in uh, I'm going to kind of ask a two-part question to each one of you. And uh, so the first part of the question is maybe really just let the viewers know in your area, in your market that you're working right now, where does the state stand? Uh, and this might be a loaded question, so the best that you can do it. But where does it stand as far as both um, wedding and social events and then also corporate events? And then secondly, what are maybe some things coming up that you're aware of soon that will be kind of exciting or, or wins that you feel have happened since this effort has started. So Megan, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, right now in the state of Illinois, we are at 50 people for events. Um, you can have multiple events in one venue um, as long as they're not crossing paths. So they basically, you, a hotel, if they were, or a convention center could have um, multiple 50 person events as long as they have separate entrances and restrooms and all that kind of stuff. But we're, um, I have said this for a long time and food for thought, but the wedding event industry and social event industry is going to save this industry. They are going to save the rest of the industry that is corporate and, um, meeting based. Um, and so we have to give ourselves a lot of credit that all these advocates are, associated with that part of the industry. And we haven't seen a huge amount of turnout from the, the, the very, you would call the heart of the corporate meeting in a convention industry. Um, we do not, we foresee in the next upcoming months that we will get um, from a max 50% capacity or 50 people, we'll probably go up to 65 or 75%. Um, and hopefully a, about 100 people for a max indoors. But I also foresee that that will go up even more quickly as we see vaccinations across the country increase um, and we see rates drop. We're seeing those rates drop in Illinois because people do wear masks and they do follow social distancing and they, and they generally are following the guidelines because they were put in place so early and they've been consistent. Um, so we're, we're excited about our summer. 
I, um, I'm excited to be planning 300 person events for late summer in Chicago and Illinois. Um, so we're, we're very hopeful about that. Um, we have to get to that because we can go across the border to Wisconsin and do 300 people, no problem, or the same in, uh, Indiana or other places around the area. So, um, that's the future of events in the, in the next upcoming months, I see, at least in the state of Illinois. But then um, for corporate events, uh, we're going to go and see, we're, we're going to see a, a very slow pace of pickup. One of the things that a lot of people don't understand is that um, corporate events have been heavily based on hotels and convention centers for a very long time. And in cities like New York or Chicago, that includes union labor. Mm -hmm. And you can't bring back many of the hotels in Chicago and New York City will probably never open um, or they won't open until later this year because of the fact that they have to for they cannot support union labor banquet staff. Let's say they, they, they won't reopen for events. Let me clarify. Um, you can't support banquet staff uh, with a wedding for 50 or 100 people, even if it were 300 people just on the weekends. You have to be able to give them full-time wages and you have to be able to bring in enough revenues to support their, um, their, you know, their benefits. And so I foresee that that will be the hardest hit industry was we will not see corporate events for a long time just because we can't we can't get them. We can't even get the hotels open. So, mm -hmm. it, and it's it's such a it's a it's an interesting concept too because you really have to think about which comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? Or the, you you can't do you open the do you open the hotels to bring back the corporate business or do you have to have the corporate business come back to open the hotels? Mm -hmm. So it's it's a complicated issue, and anywhere else that deals with union labor is going to be dealing with those issues. Is that did that answer all the questions? I hope. Uh, perfect. I <laughs> that was above and beyond. Yeah, that was awesome. Okay. That was a great point. Honestly, great points about the corporate events. And it's actually funny yeah. that you mentioned that because David and I were literally talking about that this afternoon before we got on the show. Yep. And I think it's a really great point. And also, I also maybe you can add to this as well and and get your thoughts. But I'd also to for corporations to put their employees at stake to go out to an event to go travel there and then to take on that liability mm. that might play into it as well um for sure but uh no those are really fantastic points um absolutely i do think that the liability i mean if we're seeing pushback on people willing to participate at events one of the things i strongly you know suggest often is that we have to remember that social events are they're willing participants. Um, yeah. The people who, who attend these events, they don't have to go. They could yeah. they could choose not to go, but they choose to go. So our concern should be less about those people who are attending the events. I'm not as concerned about their well-being. I'm concerned about the people who have no choice, which are the workers. And that's why I yeah. bring up and I've talked with lots of people about how we have to create these workplace environments that are healthy workplace environments. And that's part of the advocacy in the future is also getting government to recognize that we create a workplace environment every single time we put together an event. And we bring in vendors from different companies, different backgrounds, every single time they're, they're, they're different and they bring together their collective group. And without, you know, without strong guidelines and recommendations, kind of like OSHA, if you mm -hmm. don't have that, we're creating these unsafe workplace environments. And I'm not as concerned about the guests attending. Yeah. I'm really concerned about the workers. So it's also an issue that if um, food and beverage workers in your state are considered essential workers um, at, because they're being forced to go to jobs that they have to be in person for, right? Events mm. industry individuals also should be considered essential workers. And this gets back to my concept of that we have to remember that we ha we have to start you know preaching that we are essential and yeah. and our staff we don't have the choice of getting out of a contract necessarily um because of uh, of a pandemic some you know in texas i hear of caterers that have to send their workers into an event venue with 250 unmasked guests i don't care about the guests if they want to get sick from covid right. that's their business for showing up to the event but those the, that 20, those 20 catering servers who are working there, they don't have a choice because they have to feed their families. And that's the issue that we really need to be presenting an advocacy for the future for government to recognize. Yeah. 
Fantastic wow. point. Yeah, such definitely. a great point. Luke, anything to add to that on your end, Luke? Um, I mean, you know, going for, well, I think the big thing for us that we're finding is, um, you know, with the success of everything happening and moving the needle forward for us, um, I think that, you know, looking at the, um, the next couple of weeks is going to be huge. I think there was an announcement yesterday by the CDC that mentioned that if everybody is vaccinated, then nobody at the event would have to wear mask or social distance. So they stated that yesterday, and that's a big statement from the CDC. And so that really mm -hmm. just shows going forward that there is um, something to look forward to. Um, in the meantime, I mean, we have to get through all of these these moments. I mean, I, I think the biggest thing our government um, in in Rhode Island, anyways, keeps talking about this variant strain, and they keep scaring people, and they, and they you know, and it's just like okay, but, but they want to almost shut you down ahead of time with the idea that it may happen again, that it may happen. So we're like, we can't do that anymore. We need to move forward. So what we're you know pushing for is listen, let's go forward, let's you know, keep people safe, let's do what we got to do, but let's open up, and then if uh, we find that the strain comes back and we have to you know come back, we, we've done it before. I mean, in Rhode Island we had something called the pause. It literally was like four weeks, um, three to four weeks of like everything just shut down and literally like fifteen people at an event, uh, if that. And I mean, it was it was just insane. So we knew what what that is, and we know how to handle it if we do. So we we're just like, so let's just move forward. So I think they're finally getting that, and they're just you know they're okay with I guess making um, even though it's hard for them to even put down commitment dates and times because we've asked them for that, but um, they've given me a time of April tenth. So that's our next stage of, of, of movement. Um, and we're hoping to you know, completely go on. I mean, we had an action plan and Megan and I spoke earlier uh, about some of the action plan items that we're working on. So, but the, the pure fact that they asked for it, which is different, you know, normally it's like, would you take this? Can you get some information we want to, you know, we want to open up this time. It's like, all right, what is your action plan? In fact, they said, you know, what do you want to see? In fact, I have the questions here. What do you want to see now? What do you want to see in the next two to four weeks? And what do you want to see four weeks on? And they wow. gave, gave them different stages and asking us those questions. And that was the senior advisor for, um, you know, the, our governor here. So that has certainly felt like an accomplishment to be heard and being asked to be heard. So we've been doing that. And on the same token, as I've seen um, someone mention about proms, um, we're working on proms too. I mean, these students here have had, um, you know, the seniors this year, a lot of them juniors last year didn't have proms. They didn't have winter balls. They didn't have um, all of these celebrations that, uh, you know, when you become a senior, I, they're all gone. So we're starting to see, especially with our coalition, we're using the idea of safe events with weddings and how we can incorporate that with proms. And, and you know, we've come up with ideas where, listen, if you have to do an outside tent because you can get more people, why don't you have one school book the tent, you know, book the, the tent all week, Monday through Thursday, um, one school do Monday, another school do Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, split the course and be able to utilize that. So it's really just coming together um, but these are some of the accomplishments that are happening. I mean, uh, it, it's just great to see. And, um, you know, I think Megan and I talked earlier too. There's also, um, you know, there's a lot of people that are involved that have um, a little bit of skin in the game, if you will, like celebrations that, uh, you know, weddings and, and things like that. Uh, like, uh, I know our governor has uh, a wedding coming up for the family. And so, you know, I think they just want to see the best for everything. And uh, I'm hoping that we're, we're going to be able to continue to move forward. But I, I see, I finally see there's, there's light and, you know, we still got to keep pushing. We've mm -hmm. got to keep making sure that we, uh, we press it um, that, you know, again, and it, and it's great like, again having formats like this and having formats on clubhouse. I mean, I've learned so much from, um, from Fausto and Megan um, and obviously Heidi and, and a number of people uh, that we've connected with, and uh, I think it's just been great to hear and help, help help each other out to move forward. Very good. Looks like Heidi was able to jump back on with us. Heidi, I, I don't know if you wanted to add any kind of just, you know, maybe some wins, maybe some things that you guys have seen that have worked well for you so far in your efforts. Sure. Well, um, 
we're slowly getting wins right now. So we um, didn't even have receptions included in any of the guidelines. It just happened. Um, they slyly and quietly added it, um, I think like a week and a half ago. Um, and then stadiums and amusement parks being allowed to open and that guidance coming out is actually a huge win because um, stadiums are more than just sports. So that's a huge win for part of the industry. Um, and especially since we did so much work with, uh, with the Red Alert, we're really excited for all those unions that we've marched in San Francisco with and um, really put a lot of energy into. So um, I think it's coming. I mean, right now, uh, three households um, can get together and gather. That's for anything, wedding, any, any kind of event, I guess you would call it. Um, no food and beverage are allowed, which is kind of funny because I don't know what reception you don't have food and drink at. But, right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, um, and ceremonies have been allowed the whole time. So um, I think it's coming. I think by this summer we'll have small events allowed. I'm hoping um, we know that the health department has been looking at the guidelines that we have submitted and we're not the only ones who have submitted. There's been others. Um, however, I do think that ours are really streamlined and really um, translate to what they're looking for. It looks a lot like the other guidance that they've put out thanks to Megan's really hard work in the beginning and pointing us in the right direction. Um, so I think it's coming. I'm planning uh, larger events in the fall. Um, I have two summer events. We are we have plan A, which is, you know, 150 people, which probably won't happen, but fingers crossed, and plan B, which is family only. So um, I think we'll, we'll be back. We're working right now on figuring out the testing situation, how all of this is going to look like for staffing and the legalities and liabilities to the small businesses. So that's what we've been working on. And We've had a lot of little wins recently. We are, we're getting a lot of feedback from the governor finally. Um, it's not what everyone wants, and our state is um, in a really interesting place, and the wedding industry is really starting to get quite angry. Um, there's a lot of real negative posting happening, um, and uh, for anybody you know who's listening who's in the state of California, just remember that sometimes we actually have to watch our words and um, attacking the government is not going to get us anywhere. And so um, there's already been lawsuits against the state, actually, by some of the associations um, that are out there fighting for reopening and, um, and haven't gotten anywhere. So I don't think that that's going to be the path to reopening. And I think um, hopefully we can come together as a state and really support each other. And if we all get kind of united in our ask, I think we're going to get a lot farther. I couldn't that's agree a more. powerful statement. Yeah, for sure. I couldn't yeah. agree more. Absolutely. Well, this has been an incredible, incredible opportunity to speak with everybody. And we thank all of you for joining yes, us tonight. For your time. Uh, just one more time real quick. I just want to drop down in the audience and just say if there's any questions for any of our panelists, uh, please go ahead and drop those in now. We are going to be wrapping up the show here in about four or five minutes. Um, in the meantime, what we'll do is just kind of go around the room as, as you were and, and just kind of uh, have some last words. Also, just a heads up to everybody at 9, 9 p.m. Eastern time, which is uh, going to be probably about a half an hour after we get off. We are going to jump on Clubhouse just to kind of continue the conversation. If anybody would like to join us, uh, Megan, Heidi, obviously you're invited to join us if you'd like to. I know you got ladies have been going all day long so that you may have other obligations and that's okay if you can't make it. But if you can, we'd love for you to join us, and, and we usually will just get on Clubhouse after the show just for a quick recap and answer any questions on there. Sometimes folks uh, can make that that aren't able to make the show. So let's just kind of go around the, the uh, go around the screen as we're seeing here. And again, audience, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, please drop those now uh, before they wrap the show up. So Nick, we'll go with you first. This was a really powerful show, and honestly, I think it's a it extends far beyond just this like like us and like what we're doing. I mean, this is a national thing that I think is so cool that, that everyone on this panel and everyone that was able to to join us tonight, the amazing things that they're doing. I mean, we're, we're looking at true leaders right here and, and thank you guys so much and ladies for what you're doing. And it's, it's beyond what I'm personally capable of doing. So I, I commend you so much for what you're doing and appreciate what you're doing for our industry. I love that. Frank. Yeah, I mean, I just I just want to say that it is possible for two groups of people with the same goal in mind to actually work against each other. 
and, and, and that's happening in, in my state right now, the state of Virginia, where everybody wants to reopen, but um, there's a group that's trying to go about it in a more tactful way. And then there's a group that's trying to go about it in a more aggressive way. And that group that's getting more aggressive in the state of Virginia is actually hurting the group that's trying to go about it in a more tactful way. And it's actually pushing everyone back together. Um, so, so just keep that in mind that there's still a appropriate way to approach your local state governments when you're doing this and you still want to work together and, and, for the for the same goal, you could you don't want to work against each other to reach that same point. Yeah, I think it kind of reminds me of the old profound statement: if you want to go fast, go alone; if you want to go long, go with a community. Yes. And I think that uh, in in this in this regard, it makes much more sense to c- go about it as a community, so that we can we can make it through the long haul. Megan, I'll kick it over to you. Yeah, I like to say you you catch more flies with uh, honey than you do with vinegar. And um, as much as I'm getting some feedback on myself here, Um, (laughs) as much as I would love to um, see everything reopen right away, we have to be patient. I want to just remind everybody, though, that like there is an end to this. And you have the ability right now to dictate how that end is going to turn out for you. And it's not necessarily just regarding advocacy and how you position yourself in advocacy, but eventually we will not have a pandemic and we'll all be reopened and we'll all be functioning. And how did you, how did you weather the storm? Did you advocate? Did you, if you had assistance that you could provide to another group, did you take those steps and share them? Even if it's the smallest step. I remember I was on a clubhouse. I had this one, um, somebody was listening in and she emailed me the um, Supreme Court ruling of the Pentecostal church versus Newsom. It was like two days after it came out. You know, that was a huge effort because actually we included that in a response that we had for Virginia um, when we were talking to the Secretary of Commerce. We're using it as an example regarding a kind of an, a, a response versus a rebuttal or an argument, I guess you could say. It was a response. But, um, you know, how are you acting in this time period and are you acting ethically? I also like to remind people that we will remember how everybody acted during this time period and it will go down in your history as your legacy. So if you acted irresponsibly, if you, um, you know, created riots and protests, people are going to remember that. And so let's try to go and be a unified force that that so that government and the public sees us as really powerful, essential, as they were talking about. Um, so that's my my bit of food for thought on how we get through this is this will end and we just need to be really graceful as we go through it. I love that. Luke, Very well said. Luke you're up. Uh, great. Uh, that's that's awesome, Megan. And I mean, I think. I think going forward, I mean, this gives you an opportunity to say, all right, this, uh, am I prepared for something else that happens? And it, it kind of puts your mindset here and saying, okay, I, I, the plan for the unexpected. How, I mean, we, we as entertainers, we as planners, and I mean, we always kind of plan that way. But I mean, I think this was the total unexpected for us, uh, you know, kind of finding, uh, all right, this is going to be shut down for a month. Or, all right, wait, we'll we'll get our May weddings. That's okay. Our May events will be fine. And, you know, and as we continued to follow through with that, it was just like, wow, you know, so um, I think we learned a lot also with um, the ability to do uh, like, you know, even applying for grants. I mean, I, I never had to do that before. Uh, it never would be a thing I, I would think of. Uh, and, uh, you know, we did that or ever having to apply for unemployment or, or um, you know, I, there's a lot of things that we all had to do and learned uh, through this that, you know, uh, obviously, again, never anticipated. So I think those are those are the things that we learned uh, during this and, and making us uh, move forward. And I also think, again, doing things in, in a way that um, working together uh, is crucial. And again, Frank, what you said about the two uh, two groups clashing, I mean, that that just, it doesn't work. Uh, it creates so, a really bad position um, and moving forward. And I know for us, there were times when some of our um, colleagues just wanted to like, you know, just go rogue and do your own thing. And, and uh, 
Yeah, and again, it sounds great initially, but the consequences can have you know big, big burdens on us for going through that. So, um, so that's just kind of uh, what's going on there. And um, Megan, if all things work out, we are doing. Um, there's a DJ conference. We're coming. Where are we going? Is it Deerfield? Is that where it is? Um, yeah, hi at Deerfield. You, you're at. Oh, that's like three miles from my office. So. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's, I, that's amazing. Well, if we ever get through this too, I'm going to be inviting all my, uh, all these wonderful vendor partners out to, for my 10 year anniversary is supposed to be later this year. It's going to yeah. be a big party. So let's, let's get through this so that we can party together and celebrate together and, and get to know each other in, oh, in, yeah. in person. Right. Yes. We, that's what we all said. It. Once we really get through this, we are going to have the biggest party as an industry that we've <laughs> ever had. So yep. um, we're going to start getting ready to mark that on the calendar. <laughs> Heidi, any last words for us? Yeah, I just, I think one of the big things to remember is I don't think a lot of us understood how invisible of an industry we were. I didn't. I mean, I have been live, eating, and breathing this, you know, for 25 years. I didn't realize that people didn't understand that a wedding planner could actually make some serious money. And if that was taken away, that it would impact their family, but also their community. Because, you know, my events don't only employ me. I bring in sometimes up to, you know, 50 businesses per event. Um, I think the biggest thing to learn from this is that hopefully we can be a united front coming out of this pandemic and we'll learn how to support each other instead of just hustling for ourselves and maybe our own small community. Um, maybe we can think of it on a more... Um, national and global level but the, the the events industry we're, we're a big industry um and we have a lot of ability to take care of each other and um and i hope we do more of that after this yeah definitely i think that's a great yeah. point you brought up about the invisibility i mean i i can't i can't even remember how many times people would always ask and, and still sometimes people not not as often but but early on people would always ask me oh what is your what is your regular job or what is your other job and i'm like <laughs> no this is all i do like this is my job um so that that's a very interesting people point. love to people love to say to me oh that must be so much fun uh, yeah. don't you hate that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and i've said yeah i it, it i do enjoy my work <laughs> that's a great answer megan i love it with that being said, I just want to once again thank you, everybody. I, I remember, I remember back the first time that Luke came on the show with us, and and I remember saying to Luke that um, the work that you all are doing right now is going to be something that people who don't even know you right now are going to one day thank you for yes. doing. And I think the yep. same thing can be said for Megan and what you're doing, Heidi, and what you all are doing. And and there's others out there. You know, there's there's other folks out there that are doing it as well. Um, but, but I think we would all agree on, on the show tonight that, that we still need to do more and we still need, need to do more together. And, and, and if this conversation has not been the, um, inspiring. let's just be honest, yeah. the kick in the ass that yeah. you need to get up and start doing it, then, then I don't know what else can be because yeah. there has been some absolutely oh. amazing points brought up tonight. So with that being said, uh, we are going to go ahead and end the live portion. I'm going to ask all of our panelists if you'll hang out with us here for just a moment and remind everybody, if you are on Clubhouse, be sure to come join us in about uh, right about 30 minutes. Uh, just search Wedding Business Growth, and we'll be doing the Wedding Business Growth after show. It's uh, going to start at 9 p.m. Eastern time. We'd love for everybody to join us on there just for a quick chat right afterwards. And otherwise, we will see everybody next week. Thank you, everybody, for being on the show tonight. We truly appreciate you all Thank and you so hope much. we'll see you on Clubhouse with us. See everybody next week. Thank you so much. Take care.